Have you ever wondered how they make those cool looking movie props that are safe enough for the actors to get whacked with? In this video, we're going to show you the process of making a mold from a real bat and then cast a flexible foam prop that looks just like the real thing. Get ready as BJB continues to take the mystery out of materials. Due to the size of the part and mold required, we use a mother mold construction method which consists of flexible inner jacket of silicone supported by a rigid outer shell to hold the shape against the pressure of expanding foam. A mother mold has several advantages to pouring a solid silicone mold. Silicone is dense and heavy, so using only a thin skin of silicone with a lightweight, rigid support shell reduces weight by 50 to 60 percent. Using less silicone means spending less money. Even adding an additional material to the construction method, you will end up spending about half the cost of a solid silicone mold. A silicone skin will still allow you to capture all the fine detail of your part. Having a flexible skin allows complex geometry, negative drafts, and undercuts you can't achieve with a traditional rigid mold. Because we're going to make a two-piece mold, we'll first need to make our splitter board to divide our mold in two halves. To make cutting out the profile an easier process, we'll split our board into separate halves before tracing the bat shape. With the boards taped together, we center the bat in the space. We allowed enough area for our molding flanges and registration keys, which you'll see more detail on later in the video. Finding the center line of the bat at both ends will help us level and project the bat's correct shape onto the board. Our modeling clay holds the bat in place at the proper height for the next step. Begin tracing the profile of the bat onto the board. A square can assist plotting accurate marks. We then use a pencil to carefully outline the shape, using the previous marks as a helpful guide. Being accurate here will save a lot of filing and sanding effort later, so take your time. When finished, remove the tape and it's time to cut out the profile. Using a bandsaw, we begin to cut along our pencil lines. It won't hurt to make the profile slightly bigger because we'll use clay to fill in the gaps in a later step. Files help shape the tighter areas the bandsaw can't reach. We check our fit to the bat and when satisfied, we can move forward with securing the pattern to the splitter board. Double-sided tape and scraps of MBF wood help us create an accurate, level flange area. You'll note we've blocked up the pattern with clay to the desired height. A flat, smooth workbench is also very helpful when doing this type of work. Using more double-sided tape and MDF board, we join the two splitter board halves together. The pattern is secured on the front side with masking tape, and the assembly is flipped over. The pattern can be secured with a combination of clay and hot glue to assure things don't move around. When satisfied, you can flip it back over and remove the temporary tape holding the pattern. We'll now prepare to fill gaps between pattern and splitter board with clay. Pat clay into the gap and scrape it smooth using a non-scratching utensil made from plastic or wood. We begin to make our air vent using acrylic rod. Two pieces are made to the same length. One piece we hot glue to a piece of wood and sand half of the diameter away so it'll sit flat on our splitter board. You'll see why we do this in just a moment. Because we are making a mother mold with a flexible inner silicone jacket, we will define the area using some quarter inch PVC sheet to build a dam. You could also do this with clay, wood, or cardboard, depending on what's available to you. Similar to our other mold making videos, we use quarter inch square lengths of acrylic to act as silicone registration keys. We'll figure out the best layout in the space available before permanently bonding them in place. The acrylic dowel we sanded down is also test fit in the desired vent location. Before we mount these registration keys, we'll also work on a registration key layout for the rigid outer shell that will be made in later steps. We measure and mark a center line in the desired flange area. Using a tape measure, five separate points are marked to identify where to place our keys. 
we've decided to use these round glass marbles to help form keys for the outer rigid jacket. Instead of grinding them in half, we'll simply drill shallow holes to a depth half of their diameter. A piece of masking tape on the drill bit acts as our depth indicator. We are doing this step now to avoid creating dust and debris once the silicone skin is made. And our marble drops halfway into the hole just as we planned. Back to prepping the dam for the silicone skin, we double side tape our PVC pieces to the splitter board. Once the dam is in place, we'll begin bonding down the acrylic registration keys. Small drops of super glue are placed on the bottom of the keys and set in place. The process continues for the rest of the registration keys. The sanded down dowel vent is bonded into place as well. We're now ready for the next process. Before the silicone is applied, we'll spray a thin film of appropriate mold release to the pattern surface. Silicone won't bond to these surfaces, but the release will make things part easier, and any texture from the spray release will be consistent on both mold halves. We'll begin to measure and mix up a batch of silicone for a flexible inner mold skin. As explained in our other mold making videos, we use the double cut mix method to ensure a proper mix of silicone. A streak of unmixed silicone in our first layers would be a disaster for our mold, so keep that in mind. Once fully mixed, we place our silicone into the vacuum chamber and remove trapped air bubbles. We want to minimize the chance of bubbles on our first layer. A thin layer of silicone is poured over the surface of the pattern and flange area. A small brush is used to spread the silicone across the surfaces and form an even coating. Brushing slowly and firmly across the areas will help dislodge any trapped air in the sharp corners. Once finished, we cover the pattern to prevent dust from settling on our wet silicone. After waiting for the silicone to gel, we test to see if the surface is tacky but won't show a fingerprint. We then apply another thin film of silicone to build an additional layer and capture detail on the pattern. For the third and final layer, we'll use a liquid silicone thickening agent to increase the viscosity of the silicone and allow us to build much thicker layers. Only a very small amount is needed to be effective, so don't overdo it. Within a few seconds of mixing, the silicone turns from a pourable liquid into a paste-like consistency. We'll apply a thinner layer of thickened silicone first to avoid trapping air and build thicker layers from there. We smooth out the brush strokes with a flat spatula to achieve a smoother overall top surface. Next, we'll begin to prepare our locking registration keys that will keep the flexible inner skin mechanically locked to the rigid outer shell. These simple but effective keys are made by gluing our glass marbles to a thick metal washer. We want to form a flexible, snap-fit interface of silicone to the rigid backing so the inner skin cannot slump or move around due to its flexibility. Additional silicone is applied to the top surface and keys. Several will be placed along the top ridge of the mold and along the side flanges. Once again, surfaces are smooth to avoid having an irregular interface with the rigid shell backing. After the silicone is cured, we can clean up any surrounding surfaces. Remove all the snap-fit keys and trim any excess silicone protruding above the flat surfaces. The PVC dams can now be removed, revealing the splitter board details needed in the next steps. Insert a small amount of clay into the pre-drilled holes and press a marble firmly into the cavity. Excess clay can be removed or shaped around the base of the marble to form a smooth transition. Complete this process for the other marble keys. We've decided to reuse our PVC dams on the edge of the tool for the next process of making the rigid support shell. You'll notice we're purposely stopping the mold edge at the end of the vent hole, hot gluing a PVC dam in place. To secure and seal the dams to prevent any leakage, 
we apply a bead of hot glue around the perimeter. Now we need to apply our mold release. Manually brushing release into the deep registration keys ensures good coverage where spraying can't reach. All other surfaces can be sprayed. Be sure to achieve good coverage on the flange area to avoid sticking. Time to mix our rigid shell support material. BR75D is a rigid, high impact resistant polyurethane that when mixed forms a creamy, brushable material. The holes for registration keys are carefully filled with BR75D first to avoid trapping pockets of air. The remainder of mixed material is then applied to the surface. Using a brush, BR75D is evenly spread across the surface. There is enough working time to ensure even coverage, but BR75D cures fast enough to help speed things along. In our next batch of BR75D, we add blue pigment to help visualize layer coverage and thickness. Plus, it makes your tool look pretty cool too. To achieve the best bond, we want to apply this layer while the first is gelled but still slightly tacky. If you wait too long or overnight, you may need to scuff the surface with sandpaper for best results. After a few hours, you can remove the PVC dams. We grind away any sharp edges for safe handling of the tool using a rotary grinder. Sandpaper or files would also work well for this. We've made some simple mold stands for easier bench handling and hot glue in place. We can then flip it over and work on the mold without it wobbling around all over the bench. Time to remove our splitter board. Carefully remove the blocks and set aside. Remove any clay or hot glue holding the pattern from the underside of the splitter board. Using a thin putty knife or plastic wedge, start to pry the splitter board away from the rigid shell mold. If you've properly applied mold release, it should remove fairly easy. We need to remove a few stubborn registration keys and marbles, but in all, everything looks great. Any minor flashing on the silicone can be removed with fine sandpaper or sharp razor blade. Leftover clay can carefully be removed with a non-scratching tool. Remember that acrylic dowel we sanded down? Replace it with the full diameter acrylic rod you cut earlier and you'll create a clean vent hole. Wipe any release residue off the outer surfaces and place the PVC dams we used on the first half. Put a small piece flat against the vent and you're off to spray mold release. Apply zip mold release in the deep registration channels to ensure coverage and spray a light, even coating across the surfaces. Remember, silicone will stick to silicone, so be sure to coat the entire silicone surface. Repeat the same process as we did on the first mold half. Two thin coats of unthickened silicone to capture detail, allowing time for the silicone to gel and become tacky before applying the next coat. Finish it off with thickened silicone to build thicker layers. And lastly, place the locking registration keys in their desired locations and smooth the surface for best results. Once the silicone cures, remove the keys, trim any protruding silicone, and peel off the PVC dams. Clean off any flashing with a sharp razor. Using the PVC dams, we hot glue them along the mold perimeter to prepare for the next step. Apply zip mold release to the silicone registration keys and spray the entire surface. Additional coats of release should be applied on the exposed rigid mold flange to prevent sticking. BR75D is mixed and applied to the second mold half. The second layer of BR75D is pigmented blue and apply it over the surface. Once the BR75D cures, remove the PVC dams, remove sharp edges with the rotary tool. 
and begin to carefully pry the two mold halves apart. The silicone jacket is carefully peeled off of the pattern to reveal half of our mold surface. The pattern is then removed from the other mold half and we have our completed mold. Before we can begin making parts, we want to prepare the mold surfaces with appropriate mold release. Because of the aggressive nature of urethane foam adhesion, the rigid mold flanges are first prepped with a paste wax to help seal the surface and prevent sticking. The wax is buffed on wet and polished off when dry. A light coat of E302 rocket release is also sprayed onto the entire surface to aid in release of the part. To create the tough outer skin of our flexible bat prop, we mix up a small batch of BJB's BR90 brushable 90 Shore urethane material. BR90 is thick enough to hang on a vertical surface, helping to form a uniform skin thickness in one coat. We've added some white, burnt umber, and burnt sienna pigment to give us a warm base color in which to work from. Clean off any excess urethane and allow time to gel. To help hold the bat's shape, we'll use an armature made of a wood dowel. You could also use fiberglass or aluminum rods, depending on your application. To center the dowel in the mold, fishing string is used to hold it in midair and prevent it from moving around when the foam does its expansion. An extra set of hands is handy when doing this process. Adjust the dowel where you need it and get ready to mix foam. 275 grams of BJB's TC274 flexible foam is mixed for our bat. Once again, we've added some pigment to the foam for a consistent base color. Once mixed, we need to work fast because of the quick nature of expanding foam. A mold that is easy to close and clamp is essential for successful foam molding. Once securely clamped, we elevate the mold to direct any trapped air to the strategically placed vent. As mentioned in our video guide on foams, we want our foam tool to remain well sealed around the edges and let the vents do their job to control back pressure and produce consistent cell structure. The foam cures in about 20 minutes, so you can demold the part whenever you're sure the brush skin is also ready. Overall, this part looks great, but the extra foam flashing around the edges means we can back down on the quantity of foam poured into the mold. Silicone molds can only hold so much pressure before they begin to distort. Now, to clean up the part and prepare it for paint. Warm water and dish soap removes any mold release transferred to the part, ensuring better adhesion. Using a dry brush technique, we apply BJB's SC92 water-based flexible paint. We've pigmented it with burnt umber water-based pigment. You can use latex pigments and acrylic paint with SC92 for a variety of colors. Wet surfaces are blotted dry with a towel to soften and blend the faux wood finish. When finished, we have a very convincing looking wooden bat prop that fooled quite a few people around the shop. With a little patience and artistic talent, you can turn this piece from average looking to an outstanding cosplay weapon prop. Be sure to watch BJB's other great mold making videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel, visit our website to view our expansive product line, and thanks for watching. Sorry. Alright, yep. Okay, yeah, I do have this. I just want to make this thing work. Okay. <laughs> We're rolling? Mm hmm. <laughs> oh, damn.